Here we go. Um, so thank you again, everyone for joining us today. And um, I'm going to jump right into it with Sky and Michaela's help, just walk through um, some of the key principles that we think about when we look at cash management when, and that we come across that, you know, tend to be quite problematic for, um, for farms, for organizations, whether you have sort of a single enterprise, multiple enterprises, essentially having a good handle on your cash along the way is the one thing that trips many of us up. And so our goal and focus today is really on making sure that alongside smoother operations, alongside having a plan, um, alongside making sure you have the right team on the ground to help you, you're also keeping um, a sort of a tight view on your cash. So um, Olivia's just introduced all of us, all of us have just introduced all of us. So basically I'm gonna jump right into the ideal outcome. Um, for, for us, what we'd like for you to walk away with today is really to understand how cash flows can affect your business operations and vice versa. So just the interplay of cash and operations, because not everything happens exactly in the moment you anticipate it to. Sometimes the cash flows, whether they're in or out, come in much sooner or much later and can really um, change what and how you're going to be handling things. And then to work with you to help create a usable cash flow forecast. So we will be leaving you with a um, template in Excel. It's also available in Google Sheets for those who prefer to use it that way, but basically a forecast that helps you to run um, business decision scenarios to essentially just look at how various ideas or thoughts that you may have about the business if essentially reflect in what that cash balance is for you. So starting out from the very beginning, um, first of all, one thing to note with cash is that it's all about timing. When you consider the cash flows that um, a business has, there generally are two types of businesses. You're either in type A, where you're creating a product in response to receiving orders, so, you know, you receive an order, you potentially receive a deposit in advance, and then you create the product in response to that order. Uh, the second is you create the product and then sell it. That is, your production happens before your sale. Many of us in the farming, ranching um, business and any ancillary activities we have tend to have a mix of both. So, for instance, if you have a CSA, you are to some extent doing going by model A. You receive orders, you know how many shares you have, you're basically growing to some extent to meet that need. Um, and then we often have B as well because of the fact that you can't just the way livestock and production cycles go, you don't just create at demand in the moment. There's a long lead time leading into it so you often have product that is then available for sale. And so most businesses are typically a mix of the two, but if you're all honest, we are generally leaning towards the second type of business model, which is that you are essentially putting in the cash and investing in creating your product before any of that cash comes back to you via sales. And so we typically end up being in a place where we're fairly stretched in that you'll have periods of low um, cash just because there is a lot of business production activity and then potentially periods of higher cash where the cash comes in to then ca cover the activity that you have. And really all of this comes down to managing those periods intensively so that you're never in a place where you're running out of cash. Because one of the main reasons businesses fail, can fail, is running out of money. So our key essential... So our key essential takeaway... Can we ask everybody to just keep themselves on mute? That would be great. Thank you. Is... As, as uh, obvious as it sounds, is don't run out of money. 
And so cash is generally critical for us at the inception, as you're starting out your business and starting to get things in place for day-to-day -day operations, just to make sure that you're keeping things running, for growth, because you're investing in something to make that growth happen. And then alongside in just the general day-to-day -to, -day to meet working capital needs, to make sure that you have enough for your investments, to ensure that you have enough cash to meet all of your general operating expenses. All of these are components and pieces that we've walked through in the last uh, few weeks through our financial basics and even the cost of production webinar. And so again, if someone has questions on categories or any of the, you know, feel free to raise a hand or reach out later. But essentially, the bottom line here is that we need cash. And so what's the best way to track and manage your cash? Um, for those of you who joined us a couple of weeks ago when we went through financial statements and basics, I think one of the very obvious answers that might come up is, hey, I'm now keeping track of what's going on with the ins and outs and what I'm expecting, what's happening with my business. So can I use my financial statements? Because my profit and loss statement tells me my business profit. Theoretically, that gives me an idea of how much cash I have. Well, yes and no, because, and before I jump into that, I'm gonna jump into a quick revisit of your financial statement. So just stepping back just so that it, everyone knows and these are available the the workshops the webinars that we did are available for you to see why your profit and loss statement it's a logical choice it's a summary of all of the operational activity that happens within your business over a period of time right you're essentially your profit and loss statement if you're keeping track of your numbers gives you an idea of what are the revenues and what are the costs associated with running your business over a period of time Revenues minus costs leaves you with net profit or net loss, theoretically an idea of what is going on with your cash. A balance sheet, we looked at when we spoke about it, just to give you a quick revisit, it tells you what the company owes and owns at any given point in time. And then there's your cash flow statement, right? Which is also one thing that we had said, which is almost like an automatic output of having a PL and a balance sheet in an accounting system, which is a summary of how much cash your business generated or spent over a period of time. So let's say that you have your numbers in a system, whether it's on pen and whether it's pen and paper or Excel or an accounting system. You, you have these three statements reflecting what's going on. And one of our most logical choices when we're thinking about, hey, how do we manage cash is to look at the profit and loss statement. Because again, it tells us what's coming in and what's going out. And theoretically should tell us how much cash we can anticipate having so that we plan better. However, profit is not the same as cash. And so depending on how you're keeping track of your books, your business profit, as per your profit and loss statement, may not be the same as your cash flow because it may not show a few things. For instance, if you have sold a product and you recorded that as a sale, so let's say you made a sale of $500 and along with delivering the product, you sent out an invoice with that product, you're waiting to be paid. If you've recorded that as a sale, which is correct because you've actually delivered the product, it is a sale, your profit and loss statement is going to show that $500 as an inflow. However, because you have not been paid for it as yet and your customer, your client might pay you say two weeks later, a month later, six weeks after the fact, you don't have that cash. And so p &L can be a little bit deceiving from that perspective, when you receive, when you haven't yet received cash from sales that you've made. Um, you may have cash that has been spent and caught up in stored inventory. So you may pay for product and you say, hey, depending again on how you're keeping your financials, you may say this part doesn't touch my operating activities because I'm storing a whole bunch of product here, packaging, 
Um, I might have product, product itself in the freezer outside. Basically, it's not part of my ongoing operations. If that's caught up, that is definitely uh, has cash implications that may not be visible on your PL. You may have cash that's spent on asset purchases. So let's say you bought a tractor or you bought a freezer or you bought a, a packaging line. All of these items, as you're working with an accountant, they may say, hey, these are capital expenses. You're going to be using this item over a period of time. And so it's not something that's going to show up on your profit and loss statement. It's something that the business owns for use. And so you have it on your balance sheet. However, from your perspective, it is cash outflow. It is cash that's actually gone out. Uh, your PL will definitely not show any receipts from incoming loans or investments. They don't come in there. That's, you know, it's not the right place for them to be. So you may be missing cash that you could have that's coming in from loans from you, investments from you or from other parties. And it's not gonna have cash outflows in repaying loans or investor distributions and so on. So depending on how you're keeping track of your numbers, your profit and loss statement will show you some, but not all of the picture in terms of what affects your cash flow. And so for us, the logical next step is, okay, then your cash flow statement. And that's a good one because your cash flow statement, if you're using an accounting system and you have something that kicks out a cash flow statement, it is a report operation. It can show you how much cash was used or generated in any period of time, like literally how much cash, not how much is still outstanding to be paid, not how much you have to still pay even though you received a bill. It shows you how much cash was used or generated. It shows you how it was used or generated. And you can choose a period of time for it to show you, okay, how did I do over a week or a month or a year? Um, if you're not using an accounting system, this type of report requires a little more manual work to put together because you're essentially, what you would have to do is collate and organize all of your bank statement data period over period to see, okay, this is what's come in. This is what's going out. This is what I'm expecting. It's possible, it's doable, but the one thing missing from here is that this looks at history, not at the future. It's giving you an idea, it's giving you the fact of what's happened, but is not necessarily setting you up for what you should be doing going forward, which is what we would wanna focus on today. And so I'm going to leave you at this point with some homework, which is to basically get a sense of how cash has been flowing in and out of your business. You may already be keeping track of this, which is great. Um, it's again, it's not necessarily necessary to have it in a PL or an income format. It's not necessary to even have it in an official sort of accounting system um, cash flow format. This is you regardless of whatever system you're using today, just getting a um, sense of how cash is moving within your business. So take your bank statements, take them for a period of time. You can take them for the last three months, potentially. Look at what's coming in and what's going out. Identify the points as inflows or outflows. And then use our previous basic financial basics webinar to identify whether something is an operating activity. It's ongoing. It is going to continue to happen. It is what you need to keep this business running on, an, on a daily basis. <laughs> Investing, it was a one-time activity that is going to serve you for a period of time. You bought that vehicle or you bought that piece of equipment. Or financing, your money came in through you or through friends and family or through a third party as a loan or investment in the business, or your, the flip side, you're paying back something that you have received in the past. Both of those in and outflows count as financing activities. So it's kind of you going down your bank statements over a period of time saying, here's operating, here's investing, here's financing. 
if available, if you have an accounting system that you're using, export your cash flow statement from there to compare for the same period. And then take a look at what this is telling you about your business because your operating ins and outs give you a view of what generally occurs if nothing exceptional is happening in that period. Your investing activities give you a sense of, okay, that's a lump sum thing that I did for this reason. And you have a view of the outflow. And then your financing obviously gives you a view of what's happening from an external, not related to operations funding perspective. For those of you who may have a lot of cash activity that's happening that doesn't touch the bank at all, that doesn't touch financial, you know, any, so it's not visible in a bank statement. It's not visible in any kind of financial institution statement. It is even more important to be keeping track of things as they are happening. Because number one, it's just hard to remember. We wouldn't. And number two, having that sense of, hey, this is going to be, this is what I got. This is where it's going out. And splitting them even baseline into these three types of activities starts to give you a sense of what is normal course of the business, what is required once in a while and may need replacement in the future, and what is coming into you from a financing perspective. It's even more important that you put that down on paper or in Excel so that you are able to keep track of it. So this is a point of homework before we get into future cash outflows. Uh, I'm going to pause. Skaya, pause, I don't, yeah, pausing like last time. Yeah, I don't have anything to add. Every time I'd have a thought, you'd go and cover it. So I think we're, we're good. I think we're good. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, cool. I just, I have our videos sort of uh, closed up, so I don't see any sign of, but yeah, feel free to just jump in. Yeah, um, I'll jump yeah. in if I, yep. Cool. All right. So let's, this, everything that we've talked about, whether you're using your numbers from uh, tracking them on, again, paper, uh, spreadsheets, systems, all of this, everything that we've talked about so far is looking at the past. Um, what we really want cash planning to help us do is prepare for the future, to be able to run our businesses with a peace of mind that is associated with knowing more or less that if things go according to plan, here's how we're going to be doing in terms of cash. And we have enough to cover our ongoing needs. We have enough to potentially cover something unexpected. And if we don't have some enough to do that, the second bit, basically being prepared to say, okay, here's what would go. Here's what I would do as plan B if everything, if, if something just falls through and doesn't work the way we expect it. And so our, our goal today is really to help you work through, and you'll be, I'll be switching to the template shortly for you to see it. It's simple, it's easily usable, it is uh, very customizable in terms of what you may need to enter in. And the key idea here is really just to be able to set that plan. So why plan for the future at all? Uh, number one, Obvious, to set goals and expectations for yourself and your business. You're um, doing this, not just putting in physical money, but also your time and energy every single day. And it is only fair to you as a business owner that you know what your objectives are so that you're able to go after them. And you're then able to act when things go off course. Your course exists because you made a plan. So the only way that you know something's not working is because you had something to work towards in the first place. To determine if your venture is worth all that you're giving up to do it. Again, time, energy, money. Uh, it's the three things that we have in some different variations at different points in our lives. 
And it's you're giving up all three of those to work on what you're doing. Um, and you want to make sure that the opportunity cost of that, the time that you're not spending doing something else, is worth it to do this. So to set that plan up is important. To anticipate cash runway, how much time is your cash going to last you? If you're at a point in your business where every month you are burning cash uh, because you have to put in more than you're getting out of it, which is very normal depending on the stage of your business um, and could be normal depending on the seasonality of the year as well, like what times in the year that happens. Mm -hmm. Just knowing how long your cash reserves are going to last you before something needs to change can really help figure out what your next steps are going to be. And then to figure out what you need to be doing before running out of money, whether it's changing your strategy, whether it's bringing in additional funds, any of those pieces that you need to need to take account of. It's why we want to be planning. So here is just a glimpse of the cash flow tool. I'm going to, we'll share it with you in, again, Excel and, and Google Sheets for those who want it um, in that form. It's essentially set up to, um, for you to be, it's set up very much in the format of a profit and loss statement. So I'm going to switch to it for just a second. This is the Google Sheet version. Um, you'll be seeing exactly the same thing in Excel. So what we've done is we've set this up to run through an 18 month period. You could extend this very easily to go beyond. Um, it's set up in a way that starts out with sales, all of the potential um, sales sort of channels, um, sales, whether it's geographic channels or product channels that you may have that you may wanna enter. Um, the cost of sales, what we spoke about last week, the, or two weeks ago, cost of production, all of that would go in here. Operating expenses that come in after. And before I go down any further, I'm going to stop here and just go through all of these. One thing you'll see, we have a number of notes up here. Everything in here that is in black is formula based. Anything that's in blue is changeable, whether it's text or number. If you have to go in there and change anything to reflect what your business does as a whole, feel free to do that in its blue. Anywhere that you do that, you go in, change it, and your sums are gonna catch up on, uh, the formulas are gonna catch that. Um, if I've noted it here, if specific items noted here don't apply to their business, just edit them or name them so they do. I would suggest not deleting any rows. If something feels completely irrelevant and you have nothing to replace it with, just leave it at zero. Just zero out all the numbers in there. Um, if you find that you have to add additional rows, try and always do that above the last other that you see in any category, not below, above. So I've noted that in here. So add rows or sections of rows. Um, I'm going to actually just change that to say above the other line. So you'll see that every category here ends with an other. And when you want to add a row in here because you need more, just add them before the last other. You would go in. This is the Google Sheet version. It's very similar in Excel. You would go in, right click, say insert one row above and put in whatever that item is and then continue and you're not going to be um, changing any of the calculations in here. This is, again, it's set up for 12 mo 18 months, not because we're looking at annual totals, it's because we're looking at cash flow implications for your business. We generally say, try and look out 12 to 18 months. I know it feels like a lot, but here's the thing, 12 months, sort of kind of covers the seasonality of what's happening with your business over a year. Chances are, as you're working on an 18 month cash forecast, by the time you're doing it, you're probably in month two, three, four. And so you will, and then what we'd want you to do is by the time you're hitting month 12, extend it out so that it's another 12 months out. 
So the 18 month period allows you to always hopefully have a year out in front of you at least. And the idea would be to keep extending it so that you always have it out by 12 months. Um, so you have your sales, you have your costs of production, you have operating expenses, any of the, um, the ongoing sort of fixed expense stuff. And then you have be below that, the EBITDA, which, we've talked, which is the operating income, which is essentially your sales, less your cost of production, less any fixed expenses. Keep in mind here that because we're working on a cash flow basis, we're not looking for any, you're not looking for any evenness in your numbers and trying to split them out. Literally put in what you expect in terms of cash inflows and outflows. If you're going to be harvesting an entire sort of batch, whether it's poultry or life or cattle or et cetera, and you have the costs associated with that, the processing costs associated with that in one month, say the month of March, put that entire cost in March because it is a cash outflow that you have. If you have terms from the processor where you're paying 50% in March and 50% in June, split it out 50-50. But what we're looking to capture, what you are looking to capture here is literally just exactly what's going on with your cash expectations. Um, below the operating income, you have your capital expense portion. This is for any of those big items. You know, the one-off things that you may or may not have a choice about in terms of timing. You might be saying, hey, it would be good. It would be uh, great if I was able to get a freezer around this time. Or it'd be great if I can get a pickup truck, like right at the beginning of the year or the beginning of my planning period. Put it in there because it is what you're hoping to do with the understanding that you know you know this area exists to be able to see if if you have some flexibility things might have to change here i'm going to ask you to leave this one blank i'll come back to it in a second and then what you have in end here is basically a summary of all of it captured from above the only number that you'd be changing here is this one uh which is your beginning cash balance and highlight it basically you're entering in here what you're starting out your planning period with. Say you have $2,000 across cash and bank. That's what you put in there. Everything else, the operating cash flows are picking up from above based on the numbers you put in. Investing cash flows, this is coming from the pickup truck. So if I take out this and say, oh, I'm not just getting it yet, it's going, it goes away. Financing cash flows is going to come in from whatever you put in here, which we'll come back to. And all of these summed together would leave you with an ending cash balance. That ending cash balance by default becomes your next month's beginning cash balance. Because what you ended a month with is what you're starting the next month with. And then you have next month's activities and et cetera, and things go on and so on. And you have a, in theory, a cash flow forecast here. Um, the one thing that we, I want to point out that we've put in here is one, your minimum cash point, just to be able to say, okay, during this entire period, how low do I fall to? It's a good thing to know. How low can it get? And is that too low? For, for that time period you're looking at. Because if it is too low, you may look at this and say, okay, I might want to change some things about what I'm doing so that I don't get down the slope. And the other thing that we have in here is a line called actual end cash because planning is great, but what happens in actuality might sometimes not be the same. So let's say that you were expecting to end the year, not the year, the month at 7,100 and you actually ended it at 8,000, at the end of the month, you would just come in and put in that number. And that changes your beginning cash for the next month to 8,000. You've essentially recalibrated. Let's say that you ended at much lower than you thought. You know, it's going to just reset and help for the rest of it so that you know what's going on with the rest of your cash flow. 
it's really important to do this um, because you want to make sure that once you do and make your forecast, you don't just forget about it. You don't just say, oh, I was good. The last minimum, the minimum was 600. I can totally manage with that. I'm going to move on because what really happens again can be very different. And I will, I'm going to go back to our, our, this thing, our presentation a bit, but this is something that I'm going to highlight over and over again. If there is a difference between what you expected and what you actually have, figure out why. Because if it's because of lower sales, and if that means that it's a reflection on your sales in the future and you need to change those, change them. If it's because of higher costs and was just a one-off thing that you had no idea, but it's not gonna happen, happen again, potentially there's nothing to change. If it's because of a cost that's added on because it was unexpected, but now it's going to continue to happen in the future, make sure that it's in there, in your forecast for the future. So the goal here is anytime you're super off from your actual and versus your projected ending cash balance, investigate why that might be so that you're not living you know on a dream for the rest of the 17 months in there um you might and it can go the other way too you might end the month at that and you're like whoa i did way better than expected it's definitely you still want to investigate the difference it could be because the sale you had planned three months out happened now and if that's happened you want to go fix the sale three months out so that you're not anticipating it happening again. So you want to always investigate why there is a difference between the two. And I'm not talking about like if there's, you know, a hundred dollars, 200, 400 here and there often you kind of know, yeah, you know, this is what was happening. Um, it's not going to happen again. Sure, it doesn't necessarily change everything about the future. Though arguably $400 could change a lot because remember in the original here, your minimum was 600. So it's the magnitude of how much those numbers vary based on and versus what your minimum cash is. I just want to jump in really quick. Um, I think everything that Anjali covered here is great. And I really just want to also emphasize to be proactive versus reactive on a lot of this stuff. Keep track of it monthly. I know it might seem like a time suck when you have other things going on, but you don't wanna be operating for four months just to learn that you're not gonna have enough cash for the next month. Um, so it's super, super important to be more proactive versus reactive on these things and take the time to fill out the numbers, do the projections and manage this stuff and keep track of your cash. Um, so that you don't end up in a situation where you can't pay bills and you have too many um, accounts receivable outstanding and, and stuff like that. 100%. Um, okay, so I'm going to switch back to, I don't know if I'm going to do this. Okay. Yes. Okay. So um, here's where we were with the template. Basically start out by filling out numbers based on your ongoing operation. Anything that you know, put in there. Anything that you don't know, start to estimate either based on history or on what you're thinking about in terms of the market. Chances are you verbalized it, but not changed it into numbers in your head. Like, I, I think I'm going to be raising this much to sell to these many people, and this is when it's going to happen, and this is when I plan for, like, a harvest to happen, this is when I plan to buy feed, all of those things, drum them, like, basically note them out as numbers here. Feel free to add in as many notes as you have on the side. And I will say one thing, you, when you receive this Excel sheet, feel free to make, duplicate the tabs. Because if you're not sure, for instance, you say, well, if I do this, things could go this way. And if I do that, then it could be a whole completely different thing. That's great. That means you have two business scenarios. And what that would mean is you're essentially going into that file, the Excel file, duplicating that tab and filling in numbers for one scenario in one and the other in the other. 
chances are just laying out the scenarios in terms of numbers is probably going to help you make a decision in terms of which way you want to be going. Um, it may just show you, okay, that's this, you know, that's the right way to go, or this doesn't feel economically feasible, or you know, this is something I have to change something about this plan to make it work. So having more than one of these in the same file and being able to look at what one story is telling you versus another is actually a very useful uh, way to handle it. Um, now, I said don't fill in your financing needs in the beginning and said so that I would come back. Don't rush to fill those in unless they're an unavoidable given. And what do I mean by that is if you have a loan that you specifically, like you already know, these are my loan payments every month. They're happening. They're just, you know, they're going out. Enter them in because you're not, you know, that is a piece that's a given. If you're saying, I may have to bring in money at this point in time, or I have this money available and I could be bringing it in, or you're thinking, I should start paying back myself or somebody like friends and family who are who are essentially saying, don't worry about it, but you know, at some point I would like to see it. If there is a bit of an open end about it, leave it out just so that you can figure out what's going on operationally and with your cash flow, and then start to plug those numbers in. And you'll notice that there are four things under financing that we have in there. Two of them are noted as inflows and two of them are noted as outflows. You will just enter the numbers as they are. They don't need to be positive or negative signs. Enter the most positives. Anything that you enter in here, like a loan or a draw or an equity investment, those are gonna be counted as inflows in the cash flow tool. Anything that is noted as an outflow, if you enter 10, for instance, this is you paying $10 out. It's, an, it's a cash outflow. So, uh, and the uh, the fourth one as well. So basically any inflows, enter a positive number, it's an in. Any outflows, enter a positive number, it's gonna be counted as an out. Um, I say rinse and repeat through your assumptions because this is very much an iterative process. You may be looking at your ending cash balance and seeing that it gets to negative and you're just like, whoa, wait, that's not gonna work. This is a point when I might need to put money in. This is a, this is a point for me to sort of change my decision about buying a big piece of equipment or, or invest in that sort of the barn or the et cetera, the infrastructure, or this might be, this is only going to work if I push to have my receivables coming in early and then try and get better terms with my vendors for cash outflow. And so a lot of these things are going to come to light as you start to lay out what your, um, what your expectations are with your business. Um, this is just coming back to what we were looking at in the tool. The logic here is just, you know, the beginning, whatever you have that you begin with, plus cash in from all activities, less cash out from all activities is what you're left with. So keep checking back to Sky's point as well. Like this is a proactive exercise that you want to be checking in. You don't just make this and leave it and say, hey, I'm going to visit it 12 months later. Every month, come in there and plug in your actual end cash and look at the difference and say, that's interesting. Why was I that off? In a good way or not so good, like whether it's higher or lower, just investigating why it is might change a lot of things about your, your, the rest of your forecast. OK, I'm going to uh, step into just some tricks with respect to thinking about planning, because one of the questions we always we often get is, okay, I sort of kind of have this figured out in my head in terms of activities. I now have this template in front of me, and I just I'm stuck. Like I don't know where to start in terms of starting to enter the numbers in. You know, sometimes people even tell me I'm doing like this, just kind of like writing in thin air, just waiting to see like what's going to come up, but I don't necessarily believe any of it. And so what I'd like to jump into are some tactics to think about when you're thinking about planning for cash. Um, from here on, I'm not going to like what you'll see are these curves. 
These curves are just a visual representation of the numbers. Uh, the line is uh, theoretical zero. Anything above it is positive. Anything below it is your below on the cash front. So, um, but it's exactly the same thing in terms of what's happening with your, you know, it's essentially looking at your cash inflow and outflow, your ending balances. So how do you even start? Look at if your business has history, right? Uh, look at your past cash flow. If you've been using a bank or a financial institution, get your statements and look at things over a period of time. I would say at least a year. A year is nice because you have literally the entire, you know, the cycle, the annual cycle. If you have more, that's even better. Um, and you, whether you, you know, it doesn't have to be a cash flow statement from an accounting system. It could just be, it could be your bank statements. If you don't have those and you've been functioning primarily with physical cash, start noting down, and you don't have that noted down history. Like your business is just starting out. You don't have history. You don't have statements. You haven't noted this down. Start with what you had just planned. Just think about ex what I was just saying a little while ago. Verbalize what you have in your head. I'm, I'm doing this much activity with the idea of generating this much product to be able to sell to these people, whether it's a farmer's market or a CSA or wholesale through food service and or to the community in a different manner and start out with that, that here's what I expect it would get to. And alongside, start keeping track of your actual so that you eventually, like, you know, when it's time to come back to this, you have the history. All right. So let's say that you've worked out, here's what it generally looks like. Here's what my general sort of uh, curve in terms of cash has looked like. Drop anything that was exceptional. This is when you have history. So let's say you have the last year of history and you're looking at it saying, well, that happened, like this piece here happened because there was an unexpected frost. And this piece here happened because the roof fell in. And this investment happened because my, my pickup truck stopped working. And that's why these things happen. And it could be also the, the opposite. You know, something is super high and you're like, well, that was a very unexpected sale that I don't know that is going to repeat again. So when you're looking at your history, one of the first things you want to do is drop whatever is exceptional. Keep what is expected. Um, take out whatever really was a one-off. It could happen again. No one's saying it will not, but it wasn't. It's not part of your plan. That's your first step. Your second is now adjust for new exceptions that you are thinking that you might be wanting to plan for this year. So let's say that you have, you know, you have this plan and now you look at it and say, well, no, I do need to plan for that big investment because chances are that my freezer is gonna conk out this year. Or I want to start selling uh, online and I'm going to have to invest in putting up some kind of a website for people to be able to look at it and set up a payment processing system for them to pay me. Um, whatever it might be that you're thinking of, these are those exceptions that you now want to account for. Many of these might be capital investments in that cash flow template that you're using. Um, and remember, you're not keeping that cash flow template for accounting purposes, so it's okay. If you call something an operating expense or a capital, we've made the distinction just to help think through the types uh, when you're thinking about your operations, but you're not using this for accounting purposes. So it's okay if you, you know, put in website maintenance or some kind of a, buying a wheel for your pickup truck in CapEx. It's fine. It's more just making sure that you capture all of it uh, somewhere. And then you also want to think about growth, like, hey, this is where I think I'll be selling more, and inflation. 
this is how costs are going up. And so I expect for those supplies and materials and everything to become more expensive, which might adjust your expectations a little bit up or down, depending on what you expect is changing in terms of, uh, in terms of just the actual numbers. So basically that would mean you're starting from your current cash balance, which is where we were, that point that I had marked in, in yellow. And using that and the tricks here to essentially lay it out and project your cash in hand. So some tactics that really help alongside in doing this is start to figure out one of the tactics that I use a lot when I'm thinking about putting together a cash flow forecast is consolidation. If you have rent, you possibly have utilities and you possibly have insurance costs and you possibly have repairs and maintenance costs. So if something is happening on a monthly basis and you know it feels like just a lot to parse through, think about consolidating the things that are related together so that you can start to lay them out and you don't forget any of them. And think about also the things that have similar transaction timings and putting them together. So at a time when you're buying packaging material, you may also need to account for paying for transportation at a time when you're taking animals out for harvest. Again, you might need to think about transportation. You may need to think about medical care through all the months. You may need to think about administrative costs through all the months. So when you look at your expenses, instead of kind of getting to, wow, it's a lot, start to break it out by both by timing and by things that are related so that you can start to catch everything and not miss it. Uh, just having, an, in a way, in the operating tool, just gonna switch to that for a second. We've tried to help with doing that by having similar things more or less grouped together. So that when you look at something, you're also able to look at something else and say, ah, okay, yeah, that makes sense. I'm gonna be doing you know, this thing on potentially the marketing side, here's what needs to happen on an ongoing like rent and utility side and so on. So trying to catch all of the things that seem similar, sorry, I don't know why this, okay. Similar or have similar timings together. Um, another one that is super helpful is pattern recognition. So looking at your whether it's sales income whether or it's costs to determine if there's a pattern of some sort that you can use to keep replicating month after month and there are generally three patterns that i use when i'm looking to categorize things something's either one time it's the exception you're investing in something or you have a big sale and you don't necessarily expect it to be repeated it's periodic in that it's happening week over week, month over month. There is a general level of repetitiveness associated with it. Or it's factor-based, which I'll get to in a second. So one time the investment or on the flip side, one time the sale. So something big and not expected to constantly repeat. Pat periodic, taking into account things that have typically happened in the past, and figuring out, you know, what's the average? What's the average you're paying for utilities? What's the average you're paying for administrative, any other supporting costs? Um, what's the average that you're paying for anything associated with maybe marketing or travel or so on? Um, and then allowing for some level of seasonality. You know, your utilities costs may go up in the summer or down depending on where you are. So allowing for that because that makes a difference in your cash flow. Sometimes we've seen utility costs as much as double from one season to the next, depending on what the need is. And it can really trip things up from a cash perspective. So once you lay out an average, then starting to note, okay, you know, this is up, this is down. This is where I expect that the need is going to be constant. This is where it's going to fall down so that you allow for that. And then building in a level of growth as well, because, you know, even in costs, inflation is, um, 
as much as in sales, as much as you may think about raising prices alongside cost inflation is a very re big reality. I'm realizing too that my 3% right now is very outdated given what's been going on. So just take a look at what your suppliers are communicating to you so that you're able to build in what you expect might be increasing over time. Um, Factor-based is the third kind of pattern we look at. And factor-based is generally a cost or a sale income item that is linked to something else. So for instance, your costs of production are very likely going to be linked to your sales. Um, whatever you buy in terms of packaging is ideally what is intended to go out towards sales. So it could work one way or the other that one is a percentage of the other. Your payroll taxes, like if you have anybody on payroll, taxes are a percent of payroll. So there's some items that you will see almost get, um, not automatically, but just essentially deduced from something else that you've decided to do in your business. Your farmer's market fees would be potentially a percentage of either your sales or how many markets you're going to be at or a combination of both. So sometimes just your forecast has even helped by tying one thing to another and saying, I don't know the exact numbers as yet, but I'm going to use a percentage of something else because that's really what it's linked to. The more of that thing that happens, the more or less of this thing that occurs. Putting together your various patterns and methods of recognition get you to your, I, your cash flow scenario. This is what you've laid out now in that template that, um, that we were looking at together. And this starts to give you some pretty relevant metrics. Number one, minimum cash in hand. We were just talking about that when we were looking at the sheet. It's important to know what this minimum cash is gonna be because you need to know that it's going to be enough. And number two, if you're seeing month over month that your cash ending cash balance is running down, what your cash flow forecast will tell you is how many months of runway you have. If you have $5,000 and every month based on activities, you are spending more than you earn, you're spending $500, that essentially means that $5,000 now in reserves is going to last you 10 months. And so having a cash flow forecast helps you lay out your timeline so that you can start making decisions for change if needed. Um, so how's your ending cash balance? Okay, if positive, is it positive enough? Do you have enough cushion to support any sudden needs that might come up? So remember that $600 you were looking at? Somebody might say that's absolutely enough to cover because I also know that I have these personal funds alongside that I can chip in if needed. Somebody else might look at it and say, this totally doesn't work because if there is an unexpected incident this year and I have to cover for it, maybe because you even know that there's an upkeep, like repair, maintenance item coming up, fencing needing to be replaced or something of the sort and things break down sooner than expected, then knowing that, you know, even though it's positive, it's not enough. Uh, if it's negative, how negative is it? Can you change that by changing something in the timing of your business operations? Either stepping up on invoice collections, getting your picking out on your AR, working on better terms with your vendors, um, purchasing equipment or renting a space or hiring that person when the business is more on a cash upswing. So you can move things around. And this is another good reason to have scenarios to say, what if I did this later or sooner to help take a look at what happens to my ending cash? And then how do these changes affect the runway further down? You don't want to you know, fall out of the frying pan into the fire. You don't want to be like, hey, I've set myself up for two months of relief. And then suddenly a month later, you're struggling for that, which is why we want to be looking at the 12 to 18 months all the time. Because 
frankly, planning to have enough cash and managing your cash is a job in itself. And so once you do it, lay it out, not just for the next month or the next six weeks or the next two months, lay it out to give yourself enough time to come back to it if something goes off course. Um, some takeaways, maintain separate bank accounts if needed, if that makes it easier, including a rainy day fund. We have you know, lots of organizations that we work with where if you can keep a separate account for, this is my account for repairs and maintenance, and I'm going to put some money into it, saving that every month so that if something breaks, that's the, that's the account I lean into. Uh, this or this is my account for paying people. Or if you have sales tax implications, sometimes that's a big one. If you're selling and you have any taxes you're collecting that you would need to then pay forward, keep those separate so that you never even count them as part of your cash. Don't, don't get tricked by having what feels like enough or too much cash. I mean, um, um, just another little tip with like even a separate bank account. I've even had people create their rainy day bank account at a different bank in like the next town over. So it's not easy to access. So they can't dip into it as easily. It's not as tempting and it really helps them um, build up that rainy day fund without having to tap into it too much. So that's just a little, a little hack great. I learned from a client. So. <laughs> That, that's great. And mm -hmm. that's the thing. I, I think the key thing exactly with the rainy day fund is it is literally for a rainy day. It shouldn't be that fund where you're just like, hey, I'm just going to, you know, I have those excess funds. Label it, keep it, and do whatever it takes to keep it for use only for what you have it in mind for. Um, best to project and monitor on a weekly or biweekly basis. I What we have here is a monthly because we'd love for you to get started with monthly. At a time that feels right, even having a weekly, like breaking out each month into its weeks could actually be really helpful because sometimes in our, in this business, it's a week or two weeks that can make all the difference. Uh, keep comparing your projections and your actuals especially your actual end cash balance. And as changes come to light, bring them into your projections. And if they're wildly off, like investigate and revise. Don't, let, don't just let it go. Uh, it's one way that you will always stay, you know, in touch with your cash flow forecast. And listening to your intuition is great. I'm all for it. But having this alongside to help you so that you're looking at your numbers and making sure that supports what you think you're seeing um, is critical. So I'm stopping here for now. Um, I guess just two thoughts on that. I think especially when you're in the startup phase, being more intentional and dedicating more time to that to make sure that you can get up off the ground as a beginning business is super, super important um, because it's all so brand new, brand new information, brand new transactions, brand new analysis that it's critical to be really intentional about spending the extra time with your cash flow, with your PL, and l and with your inventory and all that. Awesome. Thanks, y'all. Appreciate it. Um, we'll come back to you, hopefully, with some questions. Angela, if you want to stop your sharing, um, and I'll drop everybody's contact information in the chat, but I want to turn it over to our active producer, Michaela, um, and start to ask you some questions about what you do so we can have some real life lived experience. But to get started, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about the farm and your partnership, what makes you unique and a brief overview of just how you got started. Sure. Um, yeah, thanks for all of that information. It's a it's a, always a good refresher for me. Um, so again, my name is Michaela Hayes-Hodge. I'm one of four owners of Rise and Root Farm. Um, we're in Chester, New York, and uh, we run our farm cooperatively. So uh, it's me 
Karen Washington, Lori Clevenger, and Jane Hayes Hodge, who I'm married to. Um, we are a QT BIPOC centered firm. Um, all of us identify as women. We're in the some of us in the queer community. Um, two of us are black women. Um, and so we are we call like I call us a family firm because we're a created family um and really founded on love and self and care I, I guess and uh commitment to social justice so we are about an hour north of New York City um and made the jump from urban agriculture to more rural uh we our our farm we started in 2015 on the land so this is going to be our ninth season and like I said before, we grow diversified veg and um, herbs and flowers. And we also do uh, plant seedlings, which I neglected, which is actually one of our big, we actually have a contract grow that we do with the city of New York um, and grow plant seedlings for the community gardeners there for the big, it's called Green Thumb, their big um like urban ag part of this the city itself so um we yeah all of this and for I'm basically all four of us that run the farm together we have different wheelhouses that we work in and uh the admin is me and we try to keep it so that er not anything is siloed essentially so I work with Lori on the ag part um, and that's a kind of new development because it's hard to have a farm all by yourself and it's hard to have a piece of the farm, I think, all by yourself because when things do come up and we're running cooperatively, it it's important for me to not be the only one that has that information. Um, Great, thank you. Um, so, so why is Michaela here? in our meat to market program she's here because she has a really interesting trajectory of starting from not doing this work to really um, investing a lot of energy and time with this work and and we had the opportunity to come on board with her in a different program and so we tapped her to talk here so Michaela can you tell us a little bit about how you did record keeping in the beginning and like how you looked forward at all and then so what did you do and what did you not do and then where are you now how has that changed over the years yeah, definitely. So I feel like there's so many ways to talk about this, um, but I'm going to start with some numbers, which is we started out year one and I, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I would be so curious to know who of you all are actually producing already and who haven't started yet. Um, thinking back to when we started, we didn't have real world numbers. So we were making all kinds of projections and we projected year one that we would um, gross that the farm would make $119,000 and um, we uh, of I guess profit at that point and we actually made $19,000 of profit so it was a big uh, learning curve a very big curve, very steep curve at the beginning um, and uh, but then we had real world numbers so then it then it became so much easier to build into all of these systems. Uh, we started out with Excel documents and Google spreadsheets, and we are now at the point where we are on QuickBooks um, to do our budgeting. We started out with a budget that we would create at the beginning of our season. And I mean, we're, we're veg farmers, so our work is very seasonal. I know for livestock farmers, you have very seasonal work also um potentially different seasons than we do but um we would at the start of the season or the year create a budget and then in in year one and two i and maybe three even they get to the end of the season and see if we made pro a profit um, because we didn't really look during the season because we didn't have time. We were too busy, like in the business, um, making it work. 
And we are fortunate enough that we made enough. I mean, we, I, I should give us a little more credit than that because we were looking at the numbers enough to know how we could pay ourselves. And initially we were paying ourselves when we had money. Um, and then we got to the point where we were like, none of us can actually live this way because we need to do our own personal budgets and know how much money is coming in. So then we calculated how we were going to pay ourselves based on a like very minimal hourly wage. And that helped us to start keep track of how much time we were spending in the business also. Um, so we have grown since then, and now we do um, monthly check-ins, the four of us that we call ourselves team leaders, and we also have employees or team members, and um, we meet the four of us monthly to check in about the budget. And then Lori and I also meet outside of those meetings to talk about the budget. And if numbers come up that I'm looking at, in the meantime, like we're, we actually have pretty tight cash flow this spring. Um, then I'm saying to everyone, like, hey, we need to watch things right now. Um, so, so things like that. I don't know if I'm missing anything. I made some notes to myself. Oh, so this is the big thing that I wanted to share, though, is that one of the, the watershed, I guess, moments for us was when we started looking at the numbers throughout the season, instead of just at the beginning and the end, it meant that we were able to make changes when it actually mattered. Because if we got to the end of the season and we we're like, oh, it would have been great if we had done X, Y, or Z, we're not still there. So being able to look at those numbers along the way and being able to pivot and make changes or push certain income streams like hey we need we need to boost our sales here um promote things made all all the difference in us having a successful season and so that's pretty much my next question was essentially how does budgeting change your decision making process which is what you just described and i think the important thing about what you said was that it you know at first you're just running with it and almost like closing your eyes and saying, okay, I'm not going to worry about it until the end of the season, which is, you know, almost every single farm startup farm that I've seen, that's how they, that's how they operate. And um, is there anything else in terms of how you use your information from your budget, like how you glean that information and do things differently? Is there anything else that, that sort of do, do you do what Anjali describes, which is like, hold off on investing in assets until maybe later in the year? And is that, how, how does that reverberate throughout your operations? There, there's a couple pieces there. Um, one of the things when Anjali was talking that I remembered that we have done is when we've done that, the cash flow projections and, and we're like, okay, we know we have this big contract payment coming in at, the end of May, beginning of June. And so we have like a tight, that's a, that's a tight time for us as veg growers, like that beginning part of the season in the Northeast. Um, so if, if we know we're going to be tight there, then maybe we can pause or like hold back on owner payments for a month or two until we get that payment in. So it just lets us, it lets us, um, figure out, sorry, I have an old dog who you might be hearing in the background. Um, it, it helps us figure out when, when we have flexibility to shift things and when we don't. Um, and then the other thing that I would say about that is that, um, and this is something you alluded to again, Anjali, we look at specific crops that we're growing and maybe that's like specific types of animals that y'all are raising. Um, and we can, we track how, how much we make an in income from those sales. And so as, as a farm that's like mission-based and, and um, believe in providing culturally relevant foods, 
like we went into farming with a specific set of not all of them, but some specific crops in mind that we wanted to grow. And so when we look at those crops, like I'm thinking about collard greens, for example, because they're really big in the black community. Um, we we noticed like we don't actually make that much money selling collard greens like we thought we were going to um but we we haven't made them and so basically it it helps us to decide whether it's worth us to keep producing those crops and and it could be that you know it's one of those questions like even if we love it if it's costing us money to make it maybe it's not worth it and sometimes the answer is yes, absolutely, it is worth it um, because it's part of our, you know, our mission or it's part of our love and, you know, passion for doing what we do. And the numbers at least give us the information to make an informed decision about why we're doing that. Yeah, I think that's the most important piece is that numbers become parallel with other pieces of information, like your values, like your passion, right? And they should be treated equally. And in different situations, you know, you're going to make different decisions based on those elements. But, um, but I think it's totally relevant to livestock producers. And, and it goes back to obviously, it's a good moment to plug our prior webinars, of, including cost of production, which is you know, essentially even harder for, for veg growers because you're tracking it crop by crop, but it's it's challenging no matter what you're you're growing or raising. And so you can't really stress enough the importance of, of understanding what it's, what you've got into every enterprise so that you can make those decisions um, more more and in more educated fashion. Um, so what about uh, yeah, can, I, can I share one more thing about that? Because this was something else that was big for us is um, because we do the plant seedling sale and a lot of that for us is pre-orders. Um, so I'm thinking about this again, like when you're talking about uh, breaking breaking down animals into cuts of meat. And I don't know how many of you are actually going to go to like retail markets with those. But one of the things like we're a market farm, we go to markets in New York City, we go north in the state of New York. Um, and markets are risky, like we did um, risk channel assessments, essentially. And and so some of us, the four of us really love doing markets and others don't. Um, so one of the things that it help, has helped us to mitigate the risks of going to market also is really pushing the, the pre-orders, the pre-sales, because if we know that we're going to market and people are going to be picking up enough product and income that it makes it worth it, even if it's a rainy day and no one shows up to buy retail, then it again, it's helping us to mitigate that risk. Cool, and that's totally correlate in terms of the way many people are selling in terms of bulk shares of animals, whether that be halves or quarters or CSA style subscriptions, um, or I've seen a lot of folks have pre-orders on chicken batches, you know, so that they can get that cash influx and then go to the the, the lesser dependable markets too. but all in the name of anchoring their cash flow and something that they can they can know more about ahead of time. Um, so Anjali and Sky and um, Michaela have all made it sound like a little bit easy, but I'm curious about how many hours a week, a month, does this actually take you to do? And what are we really talking about maintenance here? And how do you go about planning for the full year with your cash flow? And then how do you fit it all in during the week or the month? You know, how do you how do you stay disciplined with this aspect of business administration? Um, it's really hard. <laughs> it is really hard. And and again, Anjali, when you were talking, I was like, oh, all these beautiful spreadsheets. And I happen to be a person who loves spreadsheets. <laughs> and um, and and it's hard because I'm also one of the farmers. So I like Jane is at the farm 
and she really wants me at the farm. And I also do maintenance and I do like construction at the farm. So there's always projects and things pulling me away. And it's that, I don't know if y'all have seen this chart where things are like urgent, important and urgent, not important and not important, you know, but urgent and not important and not urgent. Like, I feel like I'm, I'm always in that like urgent, important, urgent, not important and trying to figure out which one is which. So what I try to do is schedule a day a week that is office time, like flat out, like this is my day. I'm not going to be on the farm. <laughs> Don't try and get me there. Um, I'm going to be in the office working on all of this stuff. And then when I do get there, it's a matter of trying to set up systems so I actually spend that time on admin and not, you know, all the little things that are coming at me sideways through email and everything else um, about the farm in other ways. Um, we do have the monthly, I, I mean, I'm, I'm blessed to have three farm partners who are essentially like accountability partners to me. And we have in our monthly agenda for our team leader meetings, a budget check-in on the second week of the month. So if that doesn't happen, I have to be like, ah, oh, you know, I didn't get my stuff done. Um, so I have, I have some built-in accountability that way. Um, and definitely have that once a month check in with them. Um, so that is helpful also. And then, uh, I mean, I mentioned this before that we try at our farm to work in circles so that it's not ever only one of us that's holding that information, um, which is helpful too, because then again, I, again, I have a more kind of dedicated accountability partner in Lori. Uh, and then the other thing that I would say, and again, you know, I was thinking about this while you were presenting Anjali is it feels like so much to do and it's still nine, you know, eight seasons in, it feels like so much to do and stay on top of. And it was great actually when Olivia and I started talking about this workshop uh, or webinar, because it helped me realize that we have grown, like we are farther along than we were when we started. And I think really starting somewhere, like starting anywhere, starting with something um, and tracking it bit by bit, um, you can build into this. Like for me, it feels insurmountable to try and do it all at once. Um, but if you start with something like start with that monthly cash flow tracking, and eventually you can build to the place where hopefully you're looking at it weekly. Um, just starting somewhere, I think, is the important thing. It's a great message. I really appreciate appreciate it. And um, and I think not being intimidated to start anywhere, wherever you're at, like whatever your first step is, is a great first step. Um, uh, because that's the only way you don't overdraw on your checking account, basically. <laughs> <laughs> like Sky said, you know, just trying to move for some -act proactive activities. Um, so I want to open this up to everyone here in our webinar. And if y'all want to say hello on your video, we'd love to see you. And um, now is your time to talk to these folks one on one. So go ahead and let us know that you have a question. We're a small group, so you can just holler out, actually. I think we're good. Just unmute yourself. Yeah, go ahead, Stephen. Hello, thank you so much for the presentation. It's been wonderful. Um, I do a lot of uh, USDA grant writing, and so I work with a lot of farmers who are kind of at a point of scaling. And many times I find that they do not consider their cash basis and it's one of the one of the more limiting factors when it comes to grants because a lot of times it's reimbursements and so they need to make sure that they have cash on hand to pay for things ahead of time and then potentially not be reimbursed for you know a couple months quarterly and it's something that like that's not my specialty at all but I was kind of wondering if would I be able to share this presentation and this template with them um, I can make an email introduction to uh, Bernoulli, like anything like that. I would love to be able to share this as a resource. I felt like I learned a lot 
Um, and it was very logically laid out, which I think is helpful because I've seen other things that are not quite as, um, you know, logical and easy to follow. And so I would love to be able to share it with other people um, and, you know, continue to share it as a resource. Yeah, great. Thank you for the, the, the sensitivity of the question, but that is why we're here, you know, and so um, I'll drop everybody's emails in the chat in just a minute and up through the Mighty Networks platform, you'll be able to download the cash flow tool through Excel and the presentation and the video will be up there. So this is why we're doing it. Feel free to utilize it for your folks. Um, and, you know, we'd love to have feedback about how that goes also. Um, yeah, for sure. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. More questions from my audience. You can use the little reactions button down at the bottom to raise your hand, or you can just say hello and mute yourself. While y'all are thinking about your questions, I will drop some email. I'm not sure if that unmuted me. Hello. Yep. Yep. All right. Sorry, my phone switched to smart driving mode, which <laughs> thinks I'm I'm driving at I'm at home, but um, yeah, you can see tax season. I am not on Excel or spreadsheet and culturally you know i come from the the navajo nation where anything related with the livestock or the animals it's always kind of on the the my mother she manages the book work and all of that and she's the one who taught me how to do like this spreadsheets and very outdated so trying to move from that legacy style ranching where we have cows it's always been part of our or lifestyle, cultural life way, uh, having sheep, horses, and um, of course it's tax season right now. We're you know, in that process of identifying, you know, is this a business and how do I proceed forward? I'm part of an, an association where we have um, maybe 30 plus families from our region up in Black Mesa. And, we take our cows to auction and we get, you know, fairly low prices. And it's the, the question is how do we move forward and, you know, bring it to, to market ourselves and try to find a, a better way. We should be selling, you know, range fed organic beef rather than, you know, to rock bottom auction prices. So um, that's part of the reason why I'm here, but, looking at it in terms of like some of the, the losses of how do I identify, you know, I'm not an LLC with the, or necessarily a business, you know, even though it's something that we've been part of, it's, it's part of our lifestyle. It's something that we've done year in, year in and year out. And then looking at, well, in my taxes, even like, there should be deductions, there should be elements that, you know, I know we're talking about forecasting and looking at those elements, but how to, to utilize some of that. So at the end of year, the year tax season, how do I, you know, you know, even though I'm not a business entity at this moment or this time, but, just kind of showing you my table and what I've got with paperwork and looking at receipts and the amount of fee that, you know, we're th the prices of hay at this time. It's so challenging, but trying to identify, yeah, what are, what are those grants? Where are there ways to help move our association into a successful business? And, you know, I'm taking notes and trying my best to, to follow along on all of this and, it's a lot so I appreciate all of you and the time that you put into this and thank you I don't know if there's a question within all of that but there's <laughs> a, it's a all of it kind of follows through of yeah how to keep track and you know I, I feel like I'm at that that stage where I'm just 
you know, coming out of the dark ages here with, with my- Well, you're speech. in the right place, you know, you're taking the good steps. So thank you so much for being here. And just a couple of things. One is, you know, I don't know if you were able to participate in our first webinar, which was about business structures yes. and- Okay, cool. So that is your starting place. And that's it's kind of a resounding message that we've had throughout this whole series is start where you are. And so your next step is exploring whether creating an LLC for your association, for your groups of families, or a cooperative, or some sort of partnership is the right next step to kind of legitimate that. And if that's possible with what sort of restrictions there are on your grazing permits, you know, on Navajo. So there's that's that first step of research. Um, and, and just keeping track on a more regular basis of what the ins and outs are so that you're not so overwhelmed at tax time and you're not alone. I mean, almost every single farmer that we deal with is has got a table like yours in front of them at tax time. And so that's, you're also in the right webinar, which is like, let's try and sit you down monthly, right? So that it's not the end of the year kind of Armageddon moment, you know? Um, those would be like my two pieces. I don't know if some of our educators want to give some more Hi. thoughts. I'm going to maybe put Elise on the spot a little bit. Uh, Janetta, have you worked with your IAC regional technical assistance provider? No, I'm guessing not. Um, I will have, <laughs> um, so uh, Elise, would you mind making that connection for Janetta to reach out? Um, so IAC has regional technical assistance providers. There's one specifically for the Navajo Nation and they might know of like possible grant opportunities or other opportunities specific to your area that could also help you. They're also there as just like a general resource to help you work through things um, and maybe connect you with some other resources that are available to your guys' area that, that we don't know about since we're not in your region. Um, but I'm not sure who the Navajo person is anymore. So I'm just gonna call in Elise since she's from IAC to help make that connection. Um, or Ashley, yep. Uh, that would be that would be great. That's another resource to help you out because I get it. It is super super overwhelming, and it's like where do I begin? And this webinar outlines so many great steps, but it's I definitely understand the overwhelming feeling. So I just dropped um, the link to the technical assistance page that has all of the different reps. Um, and depending on where you're at in Navajo, you might have one and not the other, but that's a great starting point and you can write anybody there. And um, Ashley's dropping her her email also in the chat as the admin specialist. So she's a good place to start as well. So we're at time, but I'm gonna go ahead and drop our, all of our emails in here again so that you have or for the first time so that you have everybody here and they're also on the presentation which will be downloaded and um we'd love to hear your feedback with our survey and don't hesitate to be in touch as you have questions come up and you want to talk about more things we are here um so last bit is is sort of building on this is our next webinar is in a couple of weeks, kind of a, a deeper dive from our financial basics course into actually using accounting software. So for those of you that are interested in getting started with it or have actually started thinking about using accounting software. Um, and that's on April 17th when you can sign up on the Meet to Market page. So with that, I'm going to say thank you to all of you for joining us. Thank you to our amazing educators. And Kayla, thank you. Or thank you to all of you for sharing your stories. And um, we'll see you in the future. Thank you all. Thanks, y'all. Thanks. Thanks, everyone.